Hello and welcome. I'm Dr Barry Harker and you're listening to Life Learnings. My guest today is Pastor Len Tolhurst. Last week, Len told us stories about his life as a pastor, missionary and teacher of theology. Today I'll conclude my conversation with Len, although this won't be the last time that I'll be having Len in the studios. In the first part of the program, I'll be talking with Len about his interest in birds and shells, prophecy and archaeology. In the second part of the program, I'll talk with Len about his early life and experiences. For those who missed the conversation last week, here's a brief profile of Len. Len did pastoral work in New Zealand and served as a missionary in India, Fiji, Papua New Guinea and Hong Kong. For almost 30 years, he taught theology in four colleges and was head of the theology department in three of them. Welcome, Len. Thank you for joining me today. Thank you. Len, last week you mentioned your interest in birds and shells. What are some of your favourite birds? Oh, there are many birds of the thousands I've seen. But perhaps some of the most uh, beautiful would be the birds of paradise of Papua New Guinea, of which I've seen close on 20 different species. Um, The long-tailed, the long white-tailed astropea is beautiful. The national bird of Papua New Guinea is the uh, Regiana bird of paradise. It has a reddish-coloured uh, plumes. Um, perhaps one of the favourite ones of many people would be the golden bird of paradise. In South America, in Brazil, I saw the hyacinth macaw, the world's largest parrot, one metre in length from bill to tip of tail. Beautiful blue colour with a little... Red, a little, sorry, a little yellow on the face. A very beautiful specimen. Now, you also have an interest in shells, and you have an extensive shell collection. What are your favourite shells? Uh, Yes, I do have a a big shell collection of 95 different kinds of cowrie shells and 57 different kinds of cones. The the most beautiful shell I probably have, well, two that I could mention would be the golden cowrie, Uh, and uh, the Gloria Maria, or the um, shell as a cone shell, um, which at one time was one of the most expensive shells in the world. A book published uh, maybe several decades ago said that a a single shell would go for $1,200. I have one. It didn't cost me that much because a friend of mine brought me one from the Solomon Islands that... uh, where they've had found a number of them in recent years and the price has come down a bit. Now, cone shells can be quite deadly. I understand that there's um, a number of varieties of cone shells that um, are quite poisonous. Yes, the most poisonous one probably would be known as the geographic uh, coin, uh, which has been known to kill people. Uh, other poisonous uh, species of cone shells would be the textile coin, a uh, uh, textile cone. Uh, I have co- picked up many of them, but you pick them up from the rear, not from keep your fingers away from the front where the little barbs I have can shoot out and uh, affect you. And the tulipa is also a poisonous cone. And a, f- a man I met in Fiji, a shell collector, was looking for shells in Samoa. And uh, he turned over a piece of coral on the sea floor and found uh, three or four tulip coins, uh, cones on the uh, sand. Picked them up in his hand quickly to put them in his bag, and one of them shot a dart into his finger. He knew they were poisonous, so he quickly surfaced to the surface of the water and climbed into the boat that was there with his friend. Uh, started up the outboard motor and raced back to shore. Got in their car drove to the Apia hospital, walked in and said to the nurse that met him, I don't know what you know about seashells, but I've been stung by a poisonous uh, cone shell. And then he passed out unconscious. They revived him. He survived. But uh, his uh, forefinger on his uh, left hand, I think it was, was uh, so badly damaged, the nerve was so badly damaged that he has no feeling in that part of his hand to this day. As a theologian, how do you explain these deadly creatures in a good world? Well, that is a question many people ask, uh, Barry. 
And uh, the answer that I give to that is that uh, it was not the way God created the world in the beginning. Because the Bible record tells us when God finished his work of creation, he said everything was very good. Uh, Death was not a part of God's original uh, creation. And... uh, But when Adam and Eve uh, sinned, death came as a result. And not only did the human family suffer, but all nature suffered as well. And uh, that is the explanation I give for the coming of these uh, poisonous uh, things, uh, which we see in nature, and also for the fact that uh, many creatures in nature prey on each other. And, of course, they're all subject to death because there's nothing immortal in this world. Mm. Last week we looked briefly at your interest in eschatology or end events. Prophecy is related closely to biblical teachings on final events that spell the end of the world. Do we have any real basis for trusting prophecy? Yes, uh, prophecy, uh, the test of prophecy actually is seen in the uh, fulfillment of those prophecies. The old saying that, you know, the test of the pudding is in the eating and uh, that applies in the, in the applied sense to prophecy. If a prophecy is given and it's seen to be fulfilled, then, of course, it builds uh, confidence in prophecy in general. And there are many, many examples of uh, prophecies from the Bible where we have documented evidence in history that they've been fulfilled. It's very difficult to predict what's going to happen tomorrow, let alone predict well into the future, centuries or millennia into the future. Yet the Bible takes on those sorts of predictions. Could we perhaps look at some of these predictions in Scripture? Yes, we have one remarkable prophecy in the book of Daniel that actually gives us the date when uh, the Messiah, Jesus, would appear. Uh, The word Messiah means anointed, and the Scripture says that Jesus was anointed with the Holy Spirit at his baptism. So that prophecy points to the date of his baptism, AD 27. And the beginning date is given for that prophecy in the book of Daniel, and Jesus was baptized right on time, hundreds of years later. Perhaps at some future time we can actually spend a bit of time looking at that particular prophecy. Now, this morning, Pastor Tolhurst has brought in two charts. Each of them would roll out to about 15 feet long. And uh, on these he has uh, the chronology of the ancient kings and uh, a number of prophecies and uh, data that that actually supports uh, biblical chronology. And so maybe at some stage in the future we'll take a a, a a longer look at those. But let's just have a look at um, some of these prophecies of Jesus, some of these messianic prophecies. Len, would you like to just take us through some prophecies that have, have been stunningly fulfilled, that are quite obvious and that they're unambiguous? I have in my hand a list that has been compiled by someone of 37 prophecies made about Jesus before he came. Um, His birthplace, uh, about his uh, mother, his tribe, his family, that he would visit Egypt, uh, including the time of his coming, which I mentioned just a while ago. His work, that he would be a prophet, a light bearer, a healer, a teacher in parables, that uh, he would be rejected. His triumphal entry into Jerusalem is uh, prophesied. Uh, The one who betrayed him, uh, Judas, not named, but uh, the betrayal is uh, prophesied, the price for which he would be sold, and many more. 37 of them I have in my hand, and I've got on my left-hand column the Old Testament reference where the prophecy was given, and in the right-hand column the New Testament reference where they were fulfilled. Mm. Every one of them fulfilled. And this brings us to the whole issue of um, apologetics. You've taught apologetics, and you had a, um, a pretty interesting way of pressing some of these points home to your students. Would you like to tell me the story about how you uh, worked with your students on probability issues around these messianic prophecies? Yes. Uh, the word uh, apologetics, which is the name of the class that I taught, actually means the defense of the faith. So apologetics is not apologizing for something. It's not apologizing for our beliefs, but it's a defense of our beliefs. And um, in teaching this class, which I taught for 11 years at Avondale College, every year, I would go through the question of probability. 
Now, the mathematicians have got what they call a chi-squared test for determining whether a chance or something more than chance is operating in a sequence of events. And um, I went through this list of these 37 prophecies concerning the life of uh, Jesus, and the students selected uh, the odds that they su suggested would be uh, acceptable odds for a prophecy being fulfilled, one chance in 100, one in 1,000, one in 50, whatever. And uh, one of my students' uh, interest in mathematics was calculating as we went through it. We always took the lowest number that was suggested, not the greatest, and um, the students made their suggestions. And at the end of it, he said, that's one in 10 to the power of 80, which for someone that maybe does not know mathematics means 10 with 80 zeros after it. Uh, he later said that that's equal to the total number of atoms in the universe. So there's a phenomenal uh, probability that nobody would accept that you could guess all those things and have them all come true. Now tell me about the the, um, the practical demonstration, the practical demonstration <laughs> that you set up for yes. students. Um, I, years ago, when decimal currency was going out, I was in, living in New Zealand and I was collecting coins of a certain date. I think the date will show on the tail of some of those coins in front of you. Most of, the, most of the ones that you've got here are New Zealand pennies from 1940. Yeah, they were the ones that were quite uh, becoming quite expensive. They were worth about 20 cents each at the time when I was collecting them. So I collected every time I made a purchase, I looked at the coins I got in change, and if there was a 1940 coin, I would salt it away and keep it. And so one day I made a purchase and I looked at the coin and it uh, saw the head on it, so you turn it over to see what we call the tail, the other side of the coin, to check the date, and lo and behold, it had a head on that side as well. I actually have this coin with me in front of me yeah. at the moment. <laughs> yeah. it's, uh, can you confirm it's got two heads? Yes, I can, and it's got George the Sixth, King Emperor on one side, and uh, exactly the same on the other side. Yes, well, I looked at this, I thought, oh, this is a rare coin. Of course, it turns out that it was made. Two coins were thinned down to make so it's no thicker than the other coins you've got there. No, it's a pretty good... Uh, yeah. But if you look at the edge of it, you can see that it's been... Two heads have been welded together, abrased together. Yes. But it's the same thickness as an ordinary coin, and obviously it was somebody had made it for gambling purposes. If you if you didn't look closely, yeah, you wouldn't you'd know. say it'd be okay. But as you look on the side, you can see where it's been joined. Yeah, well, it's illegal to have them in New Zealand because of uh, gambling, gambling laws. So I went to the police and I said to them, look, I've got this coin in a change. Apparently the fellow who owned it uh, lost it and didn't realise he'd paid a bill in it with it or made a purchase using it. And I said, I know it's I illegal to have these things, but I said, I, uh, I I don't gamble, but I'd like to keep it as a souvenir. And he, he said, yeah, go ahead, you can have it, because the decimal currency was coming in a few weeks later. So I kept it, and uh, I told us, to, uh, I would set up an experiment with the students. Uh, come in, we'd study probability, and... Um, the chi-squared test that, that determines whether something more than chance is operating. And uh, I would select one student at the end of one lecture and uh, take him into my confidence and swear him to secrecy that uh, I would give him a double-headed coin in an, an experiment we'd have the next day. And uh, he was not to tell anybody that uh, he was a party to the conspiracy. <laughs> and the next day I would say, we're going to demonstrate uh, the law of probability and I'd hand out six coins, but I'd make sure that the double-headed coin went to the person, the student that I had primed up for the occasion. And then we would get them to toss the coins, and I record on the blackboard the results. And of course, uh, after a few tosses, five of them were getting heads, tails, tails, heads, and so on. But this student kept getting heads every time, because no matter what he tossed, which side came up, it was always a head. And uh, every time they did an, another test, they were waiting for him to get a, a tail. And, of course, he never got one. And by the time we tossed five or six times, uh, the class was getting very suspicious because the odds of tossing a head five or six times in a row becomes astronomical. 
it goes way up because you go two, four, eight, you know, the first few, 16, 32, 64. But then after a few tosses, you're into the thousands, one chance in a thousand. And they began suspicious that something's wrong. And somebody called out, you better check that coin. And somebody else uh, would have another toss and they're all laughing every time he got ahead. And then somebody says, hey, has he got a double header? <laughs> <laughs> and so I, I said, well, get the fella t- next to him to check. So I did another toss and he showed it to the student sitting next to him. Yeah, he confirmed it's ahead. But eventually... I, I thought we'd gone far enough, and I said, oh, yeah, let me check that coin. So I went and picked it up and turned over and said, oh, it is a doubleheader. And, of course, the students all burst out laughing with the joke. <laughs> and then I, dem- um, then I said to them, now, you got suspicious after five or six tosses that you wouldn't get six, seven heads in a row. But that's an odds of only one in maybe a few hundred or a few thousand but the, the fulfillment of prophecy becomes one in billions, multiple billions, numbers like one in the power of the 10 to 80 on a series of events for the life of Christ is odds of our mind can't take in the consequence. What is a number with 80 zeros after it? It's pretty staggering, isn't staggering. it? Staggering. And I said intelligent people will not accept that you can toss 10 heads in a row But they'll accept the odds of this because they don't want to believe that prophecy is real. Mm. And they don't want to deny prophecy. The reason why they want to deny prophecy, I think, is because if you admit the prophecy is right and that God is behind it, then it puts you under obligation. And some people don't want to be under obligation to God. They want to rule their own lives and do their own thing. Mm. Well, that would have certainly been an interesting and memorable way of putting pushing the point home, wouldn't it? I did that every year for 11 years. The kids enjoyed it. Yeah, I'm sure they did. Now, you mentioned last week that you had a chart of last day events that you constructed. Tell me how it came about. I was working at the time in New Zealand as a pastor, and I was invited to give a series of lectures at a youth Bible camp. And for your listeners that know Des Hills, he was the other lecturer at that camp. He gave a series of studies on 1 John in the New Testament. I gave a series of lectures on prophecies and last day events. And I made a little chart to uh, illustrate the timeline of what was going to happen according to Bible prophecy. And uh, when Des Hills looked at that, he said, you ought to get this published I said, I never thought about that. I said, I just made this for the uh, young people here at the camp to look at, uh, get their appetite and interest in it. And uh, he, oh, no, he said, you ought to get it published. Well, some time later, um, a young man that was uh, at that time not a, a member of the church but was interested in what the church was teaching, he asked if he could borrow it. I didn't know that he was a draftsman by trade. And when he got that chart, he expanded it and came back and showed me what he had produced, a chart of about four feet by three feet on last day events, showing the, the timeline of the prophecies. And uh, then he wanted to get Bible and uh, Spirit of Prophecy references for uh, the, the, the bottom. So he filled that in at the bottom. It took me 30 hours of research just to list the references. And... Um, I was, you know, he wanted a copy for himself. That's why he made it, he said. Uh, I submitted the chart to the Biblical Research Committee of our division office in Warunga, and he, they approved it for publication and asked the Science Publishing Company to print it. Um, since then, we've, they printed 2,000, but since then we've printed it several times since. I think 10,000 have been printed now. That's how it came about. Very popular, still selling. So you were simply trying to accomplish something for a group of young people, and it's and older, older yeah, and churches. Yeah, I make it available to to churches when I run seminars on last day events, which I've been doing for a number of years now. And you've been doing that around the world as well, haven't you? Yes, many countries around the world. If people wanted to access the chart, how could they do that? Well, they could contact me, write me. My uh, address is three Redhill Street, Kurumbong, New South Wales, two two six five. They're $5 each, and uh, I can post the copies out and 
they can pay for the postage and the cost of the uh, tube that you roll it in, because I roll it up in a tube, and I get the tubes from the post office. So it works out at around about $12 for a copy. So for those who don't have a pencil, if we just ask you again in about a minute's time, that'll give them time to get a pencil to write down your address. If you want a copy of <laughs> Pastor Tolhurst's chart, you can write to him yes. and he'll supply one to you. So we'll go on in a moment and we'll, um, we'll talk about uh, archaeology and, and history. And while we're waiting for people to get their pencils, I'd like to just talk about these um, charts that you've produced. These are chronological charts going way back, looking at various comparisons between the different uh, ways of um, recording the years in, in ancient history and then looking at the evidence that we've found outside the Bible that confirms the, um, the dates. And uh, we're going to be talking about that, I think, um, more in the future. But if you've got a pen there, I'm just wondering whether, Len, you could just give people your uh, your details again. Yes, uh, 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 Len Tolhurst is the name, T-O-L-H-U-R-S-T, and the address is 3 Red Hill Street, Red and Hill are two separate words, Red Hill Street, Kurrenbong, C-O-O-R-A-N-B-O-N-G, New South Wales, 2265. Thanks, Len. Last week you mentioned the Hittites. Until archaeology confirmed their historical existence, there was significant scepticism about their historical reality because they were only known from biblical references. Are there other examples of archaeology confirming the historicity of the Bible? Yes, the Bible mentioned the Hittites around about 12 or 13 times altogether. And um, nobody knew of the Hittites as a people because there was no... Uh, uh, evidence uh, about their existence outside of the Bible for many years. But archaeologists one day were digging at a place called Bogskoy in Turkey, which is not far from Ankara, the capital of Turkey, where there were certain ruins, ancient ruins of stone monuments and so on, and stone buildings that had dilapidated. And when they examined the script there that was in some script and writing that they couldn't read, but when they were able to decipher it, they discovered that these ruins were ruins of Hittite capital, Bogoskoi, name of the place. And we now know that the Hittites had a great empire, uh, so powerful that they waged war with uh, Ramesses II, the great pharaoh of uh, Egypt. And um, if I'm not mistaken, that was a battle that some historians say was a draw because nobody knows really who won it. Both Kings claimed they won it because ancient kings never admitted that they were beaten or defeated. But um, we now know that the Hittites were a powerful nation and ruled a large area of the Middle East. Now, that's an interesting point because the Bible records lots of the failures of the kings of Israel. So there yeah. seems to be a difference in the way that the Israelites recorded their history in comparison with the, uh, the kings of uh, Egypt and so forth. Yeah, the, the kings of other nations never admitted their defeats. As uh, Dr. Horn told us in class one day, they, you, you would think they were almost immortal if you read their records. They never admitted to being defeated. They never admitted that they were sick or had a toothache or anything go wrong with them in their entire lives. Mm. But in the Bible, uh, as you say, the, the history of the kings and God's people recorded their warts and all. And some of the history is not very flattering. No. But the Bible records re real history, good and bad. And so that, uh, you know, gives us confidence that this Bible record is not a glossed over record. So let's look at some of these uh, points that you have here in relationship to archaeology and the Bible. What's another one that we can look at apart from the Hittites? Uh, well, uh, Belshazzar. Take Belshazzar. The Bible in the book of Daniel says that Belshazzar was king in Babylon when it fell to Cyrus the Great. And interestingly, the book of Isaiah has a prophecy that names Cyrus a hundred and more years before he was born and describes how he would conquer Babylon, and it was fulfilled accurately. But Belshazzar is named in the Bible as the last king of Babylon, but in history, we had no record of him. It was Nabonidus who was the last king 
of Babylon, according to history. And the people said uh, that the Bible was wrong because it named Belshazzar. But the archaeologists found a tablet, the Nabonidus Chronicle, in which it recorded that uh, he, in his third year of his reign, put his son Belshazzar on the throne with him. And they reigned together in what uh, is called in history a co-regency. Uh, he left Belshazzar, his son, to look after affairs in Babylon while he himself went down to Tima, down in the uh, Saudi Arabian Peninsula, and lived down there for a number of years. And when I was a student studying archaeology in the United States years ago, uh, there was a book in the library called Nabonidus and Belshazzar, a translation of the uh, Nabonidus Chronicle with the historical notes and editorial notes about it. And I read large sections of uh, this book, pages and pages of it I read, and frequently you came across the phrase, this and this happened in Babylon, but Nabonidus remained in Tima. So it is now known 100% for sure that the two kings reigned together, but Belshazzar was the last king in Babylon when Babylon fell to Cyrus. So you get initial skepticism, and when the evidence comes in, the evidence is in favour of the Bible. That's right. What's another example? Uh, Jeremiah chapter 52 records that Jehoiachin, who was taken prisoner by Nebuchadnezzar in one of his campaigns against uh, Judah, uh, took him off to Babylon as a prisoner, kept him as a prisoner until the Nebuchadnezzar died. When Nebuchadnezzar was succeeded by a king called Amul Marduk, sometimes called by some evil Merodach, he uh, took Jehoiachin out of prison, gave him non-prison clothes to wear, and gave him food from the king's table, it says in Jeremiah 52, verses 31 to 34, uh, virtually fed him from the royal kitchen or the royal uh, pantry. Uh, archaeologists were digging in the hanging gardens in Babylon some years ago now, and they dug up what are now known as the Russian tablets because one of the tablets or some of the tablets that they found there actually listed the produce that was given to Jehoiachin and names him and identifies him as king of Judah. So we have the archaeological evidence there confirming what Jeremiah said in chapter 52. That's a pretty stunning confirmation of yes. the biblical text, isn't it? Yes, very. You've got some other examples here too. Let's have a look at those. In the um, records of the Assyrians, we have the King Ahab fought against uh, Assyria in the Battle of Karkar, and that King Jehu of Israel paid tribute to Shalmaneser III. Other kings mentioned in Assyrian records are Menahem, Pekah, and Hoshea, all kings of Israel. Some kings of Judah were also mentioned they were Azariah, Hezekiah, and Manasseh. All these kings of Judah and Israel have been mentioned in records of the Assyrians that the archaeologists have dug up. And Sennacherib also made a claim about something he did to yes, Hezekiah. Yes, Sennacherib waged war against uh, Judah and, uh, and went down to capture the city. But according to the Bible... In 2 Kings 19 and 2 Chronicles 32, it tells us that uh, the angel of the Lord went out and slew um, the, uh, Egyptian, the uh, Assyrian army overnight. It's also recorded in Isaiah 37. Three passages of Scripture record that uh, intervention by the angel. Sennacherib went back uh, defeated, lost his army there. Uh, in his records, he never admitted his defeat because they didn't do that. But he boasted that he shut up King Hezekiah in Jerusalem like a, quote, like a bird in a cage. But he uh, did not record that he captured the city because he didn't. You also got another one here around Nebuchadnezzar um, building Babylon. Yes, in the book of Daniel, we have Nebuchadnezzar boasting that he was the great king that built Babylon. And archaeological records confirm that he was a great builder in Babylon. What about the Medes and Persians? Yes, well, the Medes and Persians were a coalition of two tribes. They are known in history. 
But uh, when, when um, Babylon fell to Cyrus, Cyrus became the king. Now, according to the book of Daniel, it says that Darius was made the king. Archaeologists and historians have looked at this and studied it carefully, and the current uh, consensus is that uh, Darius the Mede was actually an uncle of Cyrus, and that Cyrus made him a king of, of Babylon, but Cyrus himself was the emperor over the whole of the empire that he built up, which included the Medes and the Persians and Babylon and right down into Palestine, area that was taken over by uh, Cyrus. So what you're saying in all of this, Len, is that we have significant extra-biblical evidence for the historicity of the Bible accounts. Yes, uh, many books have been written now with archaeological discoveries. I had the privilege of doing archaeological digging myself in the Middle East in 1973, uh, digging at a place called Heshbon, uh, now known as Hispan, and uh, to actually do archaeological digging and to join the comparatively small number of people that have done that over the years was a real thrill, one of the highlights of my life. Hmm. Then what do you consider to be the most powerful evidences for faith in the Bible? We've looked at prophecy, we've looked at archaeology. They are very uh, convincing lines of argument to support the Bible, but perhaps for some people the most uh, important evidence of the Bible's authenticity is the fact that the Bible has power to change people's lives. Hmm. Amazing how it can turn sinners into saints. When a person meets God and surrenders his life to him, the, the Spirit of God changes a person so much so that some of his friends can hardly recognize him. I could tell a story about uh, uh, a famous uh, criminal in America who w was arraigned before a judge. His name is Harry Orchards. Some people may have read the book. Some of your readers or your listeners may have read the book. Uh, he uh, was arraigned before the judge, and the judge looked at him as he was charged and saw the face of a hardened criminal. He had murdered the governor of the state of Idaho in the United States. Some months later, when the case went to trial, the judge couldn't recognize him when he saw him in court because he had been converted through the reading of the Bible during the intervening months and had so changed, even his facial expressions had so changed. The judge said that he was embarrassed that he couldn't recognize him. When he came in, the last one to come into the, sit in the court, of course, is the judge. Everybody else got to be there before him. And he looked around, he couldn't see the prisoner, the accused. So he didn't want to embarrass himself by saying, where is he? He just said, the prisoner, please stand. And so Harry Orchard stood up. And the judge said, I couldn't recognize him. Instead of the face of a hardened criminal, I saw the face of a believing Christian. A dramatic change. The book has been written of his life. Hmm. Just before we go to a break, I'd like to ask you one more question. Has your confidence in the Bible ever been seriously challenged? I can say, no, not really. I have, I have been, I've been brought up as a Christian, and I'm not a Christian because my parents were. I'm a Christian because of my own conviction and belief. But I have never had doubt in the Bible. Thanks, Len. We'll go to a break now. When we come back, I'll be talking with Len about his early life and experiences. If you have any questions or comments in relation to today's program, you can call 3ABN Australia Radio within Australia on 02 4973 3456 or from outside of Australia on country code 61 2 4973 3456. Our email address is radio at 3abnaustralia.org.au. That is radio at the number 3 ABN Australia, all one word, dot org dot au. Our postal address is 3ABN Australia Inc, PO Box 752, Morissette, New South Wales 2264 Australia. Thank you for your prayers and financial support.
If you've just joined us, I'm Dr Barry Harker and you're listening to Life Learnings. My guest today is Pastor Len Tolhurst. We've been talking about nature, prophecy and archaeology and faith. In this part of the program, I'll be talking with Len about his early life and experiences. Len, where were you born and where did you grow up? My father was a missionary in Tonga, South Pacific Islands. Tonga is a, an independent island kingdom. They have their own king. And the Tongans are very proud of the fact that they have never been a colony of any Western nation. They have been an independent kingdom throughout their existence. They have been a British protectorate, but not a British colony. And I was born there. My father worked there from when he first went out there in 1915. In 1919, he buried his first wife out there in the group of Harpai, went back to Australia, um, courted my mother, who was a younger sister of his first wife, and then went back to Tonga again. So I was born out there. Most of my siblings were born there. How long were you there? I was there on and off, apart from furloughs that we had in Australia, two times we went to Australia, until I was nine years of age, about nine years of age, almost nine years when we uh, transferred to New Zealand because uh, there was a family of young children and we needed education. We had been homeschooled, if that's the right word to use. We were on correspondence lessons from uh, uh, education office in New Zealand. And my mother, being a, a teacher, trained teacher, was uh, teaching us and, trained, and giving us lessons at, at home. But we needed, we needed to... Um, integrate into our own culture as well because we were growing up in a, in a foreign culture and therefore missionaries who have children that have only grown up in a foreign culture, sometimes their children have difficulty adjusting with their uh, fellow citizens when they get back to the homeland. Tell me more about your parents. My parents were very, very godly people. My mother was a school teacher. My father was not trained as a school teacher, but he, he, he was principal of school and principal of a college in Tonga for many years. He um, was a pastor and uh, was in charge of our work out there for many years. And uh, five of, my, of the seven children in our family were born there. My parents had six children of their own and one adopted one. And uh, the adopted one was born in Australia. Their first one was born in New Zealand. And the rest of us were born uh, in Tonga. Tell me about your siblings. Oh, well, the adopted girl um, married and lived in Australia. She was married before my younger sister was born. So uh, they never met until uh, uh, one of my sisters was getting married. And the older girl from Australia came to New Zealand to join up and see the family because my father happened to be working in New Zealand at that time. Uh, that's when they, the younger sister and the older sister first met each other. What about your brothers? You have some brothers. I have one brother. He also became a pastor. He worked as a pastor and in, as an evangelist in Australia for many years. Went into, called into administration and ended up his last job was undersecretary in the General Conference in the United States, now living in retirement in Australia. What was life like in your family? It was simple. We, um, living in, in Tonga, we, we ate local foods, sweet potato and yams and uh, uh, maybe some cassava, as they call it in some countries. Manioki, they call it in Tonga. It's a root crop. And... Uh, it was just, uh, well, for us, it was just normal life. We knew nothing else. What are the sorts of things you did as a child? Well, Tonga was famous at that time for overpopulation of rats. We had a fox terrier who loved to hunt rats. And a lot of our entertainment was to go rat hunting with him. <laughs> We'd get a pile of coconut leaves and, and rubbish and uh, there would be rats in there. And we'd just say to him, come on, come on, come on, Jackie, come on, rats. Ksk, ksk. And he would get excited and start sniffing around until he got the smell of a rat, and then he would dig. And we dug them out of holes, and twice we caught nine rats in a day. How's that? That was, that was entertainment for us. <laughs> now, 
there's something happened to you while you were in Tonga. Yes. It's a pretty vivid memory of yours. Would you well, like to tell us about that? No, I, it's not a memory of mine, Barry. I, um, I didn't know that, I, that it had happened, but I was told about it by somebody a few years ago. Uh, you know, as you, when you're young, your brain is not developed. It doesn't stop developing until you're almost the end of your teens, early 20s, when your brain fully develops. But one of the features of an undeveloped brain is that it doesn't think ahead of consequences. Because some older people have that problem, still have that problem, don't they? <laughs> and, but um, I, I, one of the Tongans was cutting a hedge, not with clippers, as we would use, but using a great big knife with a blade of about two feet or more long, a great big long blade knife. And he was swinging this knife and slashing the hedge to cut it and trim it down. And I thought it would be funny to give him a scare. So I hid in the hedge. And just as he was about to come where I was, I jumped up and gave him a fright. I didn't realize that uh, I might have had my head completely chopped off. <laughs> Don't think of consequences when you're young. Foresight's a wonderful thing, isn't it? It's a yeah. wonderful thing to develop. <laughs> yes. And uh, I guess that's why we have parents, to help make sure we arrive yeah. at adulthood. Yes. Thankfully, it didn't, I, it didn't happen. I didn't get my head chopped off. <laughs> How old were you when you left Tonga? I was about nine years old. World War II had just started. And as we... My, my father was called to go and work for Maori people in New Zealand because... Um, they wanted someone that uh, knew some contact with Polynesian people to work for the Marys, who are also Polynesians. So, and we children needed schooling in our, among our fellow European young people to uh, get us encultured into Western society. So we went to New Zealand, and on the ship, because war was on and German raiders were known to be ro roaming around the world, Remember, they shot and, and, and uh, sank the HMS Sydney off Western Australia. The Matua, the little island trading boat that we were on, had a, about a three-inch uh, cannon shell on the back of the boat, and I remember seeing the crew practising the cannon. They weren't firing it, but they were pretending to fire it and aim it and that so on. I watched them from the deck. Uh, the ship was blacked out at night. No portholes were allowed to be open, sail in the dark, and no lights on. Um, that was an experience coming across the ocean in wartime. Did you have trouble adjusting to New Zealand? Yeah, I suppose I did. I, well, I know I did. I, um, it took me some years to really integrate back into European way of life and society and way of, of thinking and attitudes to others. It, uh, it wasn't always easy. And I've seen other missionaries' children go through a similar adjusting process when they come back. When you came to New Zealand, you finished your schooling there, then you went to Longburn College, then to Avondale College here in Australia, and you ended up studying in America. Briefly, how did that come about? Well, I, um, I, wanted to, I felt a call of God to ministry quite early in my life, when I was about 14, about 15, 16, or thereabouts. But I felt that later that I wanted to be a teacher as well. So when I came to Australia to study at Avondale College, I only had six subjects left to do to finish the ministerial course because I had done a heavy program in Longburn College, uh, including Greek 1 there. So I did Greek 2 my first year at Avondale. I thought that I was not yet mature enough to go into the ministry at that age. I was only 19 when I came to Avondale. So I enrolled in the teaching course and did the teaching course and the ministerial course together and graduated from both at the end of two years. And uh, during that time, I decided that I wanted to get further qualifications to go into Bible teaching. So I then went off, applied to go off to uh, study in America. And that's where we had an interesting experience because to get into America as an immigrant, you needed an affidavit of support from someone that to guarantee the U.S. government that you would not become a taxpayer expense if you had an accident and became a paraplegic or something. So 
I could go in and get an affidavit of support from the church head office in America if I went as a student. But if I fell, if I got short of money, then I'd have to leave America and get out and go work in Canada or somewhere and then reapply to get back into the States. So I wanted to go in as an immigrant. But uh, how was I going to get an affidavit of support? So when I graduated from Avondale with what is known as the Licentiate of Theology degree after my third year at the college, the speaker at our graduation was uh, Pastor Branson, the General Conference President, and he um, offered, when I talked to him, he offered to sponsor me. But because of the risk involved, he asked for the uh, division of the church in Australia to underwrite his uh, individual sponsorship. They said they would if the union conference backed it. And the union conference said they would if the local conference backed it. The local conference agreed, because my dad was on their payroll, and um, sent it back to the union. The union sent it back to the division, but the general conference uh, treasurer was sitting in the committee on a visit from America at that meeting, and he blocked it. He said, this is contrary to policy. You can't give a permanent sponsorship, a sponsorship, and underwrite it. So I was left with no sponsorship, and the boat was going in about three weeks. But when the, Pastor Branson heard about what had happened, he called an emergency meeting of the General Conference Committee and said, we've got an item on the agenda here. I want a sponsorship voted for this young man from Australia to come and study in America. And he put it through the committee contrary to policy. And to prove they had the assets that to back the affidavit of support, they sent me a copy of the General Conference balance sheet, which I submitted to the American Embassy down in Wellington in New Zealand at and got my affidavit, got my quote to go. So when you went to America, you did your MA in theology? Yeah, I had to do my BA in, in theology first, which I did at Pacific Union College in California. And then I went to um, the seminary, which at that time was in Washington, D.C. This was 1954-55. And I graduated in 55. This was before there was any Andrews University. We then took a call to go to India. We had wanted to go to Africa. By this time, I was, um, uh, I was married. My wife had been called to Africa as a nurse before I even knew her. But there was a mix-up, and she didn't get to go. The office thought that she had declined, but she hadn't. The other girl that was called declined, but not her. So she then got another call to go to Africa, and I put in my call for her to come to America and get married instead, so she accepted my call. <laughs> so uh, she came across, but she couldn't get a visa to come into America for about two years. But when we got married, she was able to get a visa in three months to come in as the wife of an American resident, which I was officially at that time. Glenn, you told me that you thought you'd had a pretty unremarkable life, yet you've seen places and done things quite out of the ordinary. Looking back on your life, is there anything that you would want to change about it? Well, I'm a believer that God is in charge of your life when you commit yourself to him, and I suppose that I'd have to say, well, no, uh, uh, probably I wouldn't change anything on my career path. Worked out the way God wanted it to work out. And uh, that's, you know, I'm, I'm content with that. Um, while I may not have had a very remarkable life, I've had one or two remarkable experiences. We talked about one of them last week, didn't mm. we? The mm, res we did. rescue of the American shipwreck family. And I've had one or two other interesting experiences. And I, I have had the opportunity of extensive travel. I, I, I like to visit other countries. I'm very international in my outlook on, on things. I've been in... Um, 71 countries now, and I've got some more lined up for this this year. Nepal and uh, Burma are lined up already, and maybe some other countries over in Asia where I'll go preaching this year, around uh, middle of the year and into early second half of the year. Your, tr your teaching career must have been very satisfying. Yes, uh, I, I, have, um, I have always thought that I was... Uh, Fortunate to have had the experience I had teaching. I've enjoyed it, and um, 
if I can say so, I, th I think my students enjoyed. We, I had good rapport with my, my, most of my students, very good rapport. And um, you always get one or two that are not happy with you in life, but uh, most of my students have been very kind to me and treated me very, very nicely, shall I say, both in class and since as friends and colleagues. And what have you learned from your life that you would like to share with our listeners today? What's something that you think everyone ought to know? Well, we all ought to know the Saviour. That's paramount, most important. We need to know Jesus as our personal Saviour. Because the Bible says we all have sinned, all have come short of the glory, or I like to think the glory of God is his character. We all come short of the character of God in our life because we are sinners by nature. But God is merciful and he forgives. And I thank him for that. And uh, we all need that personal relationship with, uh, with him and with Jesus, our Savior. And uh, that has been the cornerstone of uh, my experience, my life, and I wouldn't want to change that at all. Hmm. Do you have a favorite passage of Scripture you'd like to share with us? Yes, I suppose one of my favorite passages, of course there are many, would be Ephesians 2, 8 to 10. Ephesians 2 verse 8 says, For by grace are ye saved through faith, that not of yourselves is the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. I've thought a lot about that text. What if our salvation depended on what we could do? what we could work, then uh, salvation would be easier for some people to get than others because some people can do more work than others. The very fact that a person has more talents, and we recognize that people do have di differences in talents. Some have more, some have less. The, the parable Jesus told tells us that. One man was given five, one man two, one man one. We all have different abilities, different talents. They are distributed around. If our use of those talents could advance our chance of salvation, the person with more talents would have more chance of salvation than the person with fewer. And so it would become unfair. That's why the Bible says, not of works. What we do does not earn us a place in heaven. It is God's gift. And it's hard for some of us to accept that because we are brought up in our culture, aren't we? If you want something, get a job and work for it. My son came to me one day and said, Dad, I want to build a yacht. He was in high school. I said, you couldn't build a yacht. You wouldn't know how. He said, well, all the boys in my class are going to build a yacht. That's our woodwork uh, project. Uh, and the teacher's going to help us to build one. Well, I knew the teacher could build one. So I said, well, how much is it going to cost? He said, about $100. <laughs> I said, son, I don't have $100 to give you. You know, the family paying church school fees on virtually one salary. Most of the time, a lot of the time. Uh, I, and his face fell. I said, well, look, I'll give you $50. You'll have to earn the rest. Within a week, he had a job. And he earned the rest. I gave him the $50 I promised him, and he built the yacht and took me out sailing on Lake Macquarie. Took my wife out with him on Lake McCoy. We had a great time, and we had fun on the lake with this, this uh, craft that he built. So we'd, if you want something, work for it. If you want something, earn it. That's what we had taught, you know. But when it comes to salvation, we have to change gears in our thinking. It's a gift. You don't earn it. You can't earn it. It's God's gift. A gift and wages are mutually exclusive. If you work for something, you get wages. It's not a gift. If you're given a gift, it's something you haven't earned. And so some people think, well, then works don't matter at all. And they quote verse 8 and verse 9, but a very few people I hear quote verse 10. And I like to quote it because it makes a complete package. It goes on to say, we were created for good works. That's verse 10. We were created for good works. Yes, we do good works, not to earn salvation, 
but to show our appreciation because we've received the gift. As Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. And that's the basis of the gospel. Salvation is free. You can't earn it. It's God's gift when we accept Jesus as our Savior. But then, as the words of the hymn go, I would not work my soul to save, for that the Lord hath done, but I would work like any slave for the love of God's dear Son. Len, would you like to close our conversation with prayer today? Yes. Father in heaven, I want to thank you for the wonderful gift that you give us in Jesus. A gift for which we cannot work, a gift we cannot earn. It's given to us as a gift when we accept Jesus as our Savior. But then in gratitude, we do what we can to advance your kingdom on earth and to live a life of obedience to your commandments, as we are told to do in Scripture. Keep us faithful, we pray thee, till Jesus comes and give us a place in his kingdom, because we ask it in his name. Amen. Amen. Len, thank you very much for talking with me again today. As I mentioned before, this won't be the last time that I'll talk with you on air. I've really enjoyed the two conversations that we've had, and I wish you well for the year ahead. Thank you. And pray that the Lord will bless you and keep you healthy so that you can continue to do the work that you love to do. Thank you. I'm Dr. Barry Harker, and you've been listening to Life Learnings. Remember to tune in again next time as I speak with another fascinating guest. Bye for now, and God bless you and keep you. You've been listening to a production of 3ABN Australia Radio.